a warm welcome to all present here today for the Change Maker 20 Summit, where visionaries and change change agents unite to catalyze global transformation. Through collaboration and innovation, we embark on a journey to address challenges, inspire action, and forge a path to a brighter tomorrow. Together, we shape the future we aspire to see. Distinguished attendees of the Change Maker 20 Summit, we welcome you to today's panel discussion. Let's join for a discussion with visionary chief sustainability officers, pioneering technology providers, and accreditation experts. Discover their journeys in combating climate change, overcoming obstacles, and achieving net zero goals. Learn how you can lead and inspire climate action within your circles, fostering a virtuous cycle of progress and shared success. Our esteemed panelists, each of us in their respective domains, are here to ignite conversations that transcend boundaries and open new avenues for positive impact. Today, As the moderator of this panel, we have with us Mr. Jagdish Rao Raghavendra. With over 30 years in IT and digital services, Mr. Rao has fueled the success of startups and scale-ups. His boardroom expertise and non-executive roles showcase their skill in strategy, investment, and green business solutions. Proficient in Azure, AWS, GCP, and more, he leads Innovo's emission reduce, reduction efforts. crafting compelling cases for sustainable solutions like ccus and renewable energy his commitment to sustainability and a depth stakeholder engagement cements his role as a leader in eco-friendly innovation so please take the stage and without further ado let's commence this invigorating exchange of ideas over to you sir thank you ulvi uh, and thank you change maker 20 and the G20 presidency of india for giving us this opportunity to share uh, the successes that uh, corporations and technology providers uh, have achieved in terms of achieving the net zero goals and the climate actions that they bring in uh, a very set uh, inspiring set of climate actions despite very tough economic environment i would uh, talk about the uh, topic of the climate action and environment sustainability uh, first and why is it important to the globe the corporations and as individuals and it's summarized well uh, by uh, the un sustainability development goals and let me share this particular screen um The climate action and environment of sustainability is focused on mitigating climate change by reducing greenhouse gases, transitioning to renewable energy sources, but also promoting eco-friendly practices. This theme also highlights the importance of conserving ecosystems, protecting endangered species, and preserving natural resources to maintain biodiversity. and ensure long term environmental sustainability rather than me talking about it uh, you will hear from the leaders uh, such as ervin and ashok who are leading their respective corporation sustainability efforts uh, across many divisions within their companies across many plants within their companies and you'll also hear from the technology providers all cxos whether it's uh curtis who is on the call nanotech energy pioneering the shift towards graphene based batteries for example or julius who have who in their organization have come up with recyclable renewable energy uh, capabilities there's also richard collins uh, carlos who are all likely to join in the next few minutes uh curtis who has been leading csr policy implementation within corporations and public sector as well as influencing change in governments carlos whose organization remediate has been uh, converting emissions which are treated as a waste and instead they are looking at it as a feedstock for an asset to clean up the planet as well as feed the world and that is michaela kendo who are looking at one of the many avenues to getting rid of emissions which is hydrogen as a route and kedar murthy from 
Nuvera, who are also looking at hydrogen-based engines as one of the many hybrid energy transition routes. So an expert panel for you to learn from. And we are also here to learn from your questions and see what we can do to help the uh, world in a better shape than as we inherited. I will stop there and I'll ask Irvin to introduce himself first, please. Uh, a short introduction, Irvin, and then I'll ask uh, Curtis and Julius to introduce himself. Thank you, Jagdish. Thank you, Connecting Dreams. Uh, Jagdish, you have already introduced me. I am Dr. Arvind Budhankar. I have about 34 years of experience, primarily in environmental sustainability space. While I did some double hatting, uh, especially on project management, business development, and HR also. Uh, but mostly my career uh, was in environmental sustainability. And of late, I have been talking about ESG. Uh, I My career spans uh, mostly in the hard to effect sector, started my career with the fertilizer company, petrochemical fertilizer company producing uh, ethanol, nitric acid, urea, uh, diammonium, ammonium, diammonium phosphate, all those kind of things and then moved to steel and currently I am with cement. So last 10 years almost uh, I am with cement now, so fertilizer, petrochemical, steel and cement. That's my career is all about. Uh, I currently work with Dalmia Cement, uh, which is uh, one of the major cement producers in India. Uh, our installed capacity is close to 41 million tons. Uh, uh, but uh, besides being a major cement producer, I, pr I can proudly say that we are the most sustainable cement producer across the globe. And uh, while I say that I have numbers that can substantiate, so our CO2 footprint per ton of cement is uh, just 462 and uh, the global average is somewhere around 620 and India average is around 560. So we are almost 100 kg less than the Indian average and almost 150 kg lesser than the uh, uh, global average. Uh, we are the first company, uh, not only a cement company, first uh, hard to operate sector company which has competed for uh, carbon negative uh, cement and this we did way back in 2018, uh, just a couple of years down the line to Paris uh, when people were uh, even struggling, you know, what could be our roadmap, what targets we should be setting. So we, uh, even before uh, uh, subscribing to science-based target, we had committed that we will be carbon negative by 2040, uh, where most of the global companies have said that they will be car net zero by 2050. And uh, people literally laughed at us at that point of time. But uh, we say this is our intent. Let's see. Uh, today, we don't know all the answers. Uh, but we'll find out those answers and uh, today I'm very happy that uh, since we committed I could we could reduce our footprint by almost 11 to 12 uh, percent which is way ahead of the target which has been given by the science-based target initiative uh, although the, the efforts what we have done uh, we just plug the low-hanging fruits uh, but uh, go, the road map uh, the road ahead may not be that uh, uh, easier and it's going to be tougher and tougher especially uh, in absence of finances and I'll talk a bit about that later uh, but uh, besides uh, CO2 my company is also almost uh, 14 times water positive that means uh, we actually harvest 14 times more water than what we consume in cement producing and uh, we are more than two times plastic negative. That means uh, whatever plastic we consume in the form of bags, LDP bags, uh, we almost uh, double of that uh, we recycle uh, back into the system. So these are some of the uh, key features of my organization. And uh, maybe I'll speak how we achieved that, what are the challenges, all those things, you know, Jagdish, I'll leave it to you. Let me take a pause over here. I know I'm eating out somebody else's time. So let me take a pause and hand it over back to Jagdish. Thank you very much, Arvind. I mean, uh, that's an incredible achievement uh, in itself. Uh, surely an inspirational 
achievement because cement industry is considered hard to abate and the most difficult uh, and as I'll talk about it I'll ask you through the questions later but as a few highlights the process itself generates emissions you guys have managed to overcome the energy uh, part of it you got into renewable energy but uh, the process challenges i think that's the biggest thing that you guys are trying to overcome and in the process uh, it's amazing that you have uh, achieved uh, such brilliant uh, uh water positivity and waste positivity uh, so yeah we we'll delve into the details uh, shortly thanks for that introduction avin i will now request uh, uh, julius to introduce himself please so julius a short introduction into your renewable energy space uh hello my name is uh, julius uh, i am representing company solitech i'm ceo of company solitech solitech is a, a renewable energy photovoltaic company from lithuania from europe uh, we are in the market since 2009 with the production of the solar cells uh, uh, pv panels and now started the production of uh, energy storage solutions uh so solitech entered to the market with a different uh, view uh, since the beginning uh by by putting a lot of efforts in uh, r&d and development of our products uh to make them very long uh, lifetime uh where our let's say pv panels can withstand 50 years uh, lifetime so our view to to the market is uh, is to invest into long term solutions uh which bring uh value for everyone for the investor for the society uh to 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 have the cheapest energy generation over the long term um also on the other hand uh we have developed our products to be fully recyclable and as friendly as possible uh to to the nature so by using uh recyclable materials uh we were nominated as the greenest solar pv panel in, in the world by obtaining a cradle to cradle gold level certification which is where we are the only company in in the world to to have this uh moreover from our production point of view uh, all of our factories uh, are with co2 zero emission uh, constructed uh, in in this way uh so from the construction to the materials to the lifetime of pv panel uh we we want to make uh, our products uh, let's say as sustainable as possible so later i can i can emphasize a bit more about it. so shortly this is this is about us Julius thank you very much as the CEO of such a wonderful company thanks for making the time i'm sure the audience will learn from you a lot in terms of how and the biggest thing is innovation need not be monopolized by just one country it could come out from any part of the globe and that's what you are doing is just a classic example of how anyone from anywhere can innovate and bring out the best in class uh and uh, thank you it's very inspiring to have you here as well and part of this panel discussions to uh, this uh Curtis over to you next uh an amazing portfolio of technologies for battery energy storage systems can you introduce yourself please yeah i'm kurt collar i'm the <clears throat> chief marketing sales officer for nanotech and ceo of nanotech europe Um at Nanotech we, we've got multiple things. Um Nanotech was founded in 2014 to industrialize graphene. And graphene in its own right is a super material um enabling all sorts of great things and since uh, Arvin's on here uh, one of the things we've been working with is uh graphene in concrete applications to increase strength and reduce the CO2 emissions by up to 30%. So um definitely something the is near and dear to what nanotech does at its heart is look for opportunities to really take the graphene and change the world with it. Uh one of those applications is battery technology. So we've uh commercialized a line of graphene powered batteries 
which are used in a half dozen applications for consumer electronics um, through uh, energy storage systems is an area that we're expanding to. And in energy storage systems, the great thing about um, the developing market and, and the need there is it, it enables the use of solar energy around the clock, right? It enables the use of these green technologies like what Julius is offering. Um, it enables people to put these in their homes and, and run your home on natural energy all day long. Com combining technologies, you know, like I, like I just gave the example with Arvind or, or with Julius, that, that's what we're here to talk about, right? That's what this is all about. Um, yes. Making sure that we're able to develop the right things and put them to market. And um, then we're responsible with them while we do it. You heard Arvind explain how, how responsible they are. And Julius, the 50 year life cycle. I mean, these are huge accomplishments when you talk about, uh, I think solar cells, best case, you typically get 15, maybe 20 years out of them before you're recycling them and then have to take all the nasty chemicals out. Lasting 50 years and recycling is huge. So we intend to do the same thing. At Nanotech, we've created, we partnered with BASF and created a complete circular supply chain. Every one of our batteries gets returned to BASF and all of the, all those batteries get shredded, taken apart. All those, all the valuable raw materials get taken back out and put back in, into new feedstocks that we, we then make into new batteries. So whether it's uh, the graphene that can enhance a composite or a, or a um, adhesive or a uh, co concrete application, or as our batteries, I think sustainability is at the heart of everything that everybody's doing right now. And uh, we're happy to be part of it. Thank you very much, Curtis. Uh, more important, uh, it's very early in the morning for you. Uh, very grateful for joining uh, this uh, being in the US and a brilliant set of technologies as you rightly brought out. Uh, what you are doing is uh, something that can supplement or complement any initiative, whether it's renewable energy or circularity and the like. And uh, a yeah, brilliant set of concepts. Uh, I'm sure the audience will also be equally keen to know how they can get inspired to do more things and better things. Uh, I now ask uh, Carlos to introduce uh, himself, the brilliant set of technologies again. Uh, Please, over to you, Carlos, for your introductions, please. Thank you, Jagadish, and I'm very happy to be here at the uh, G20 uh, Climate Change Conference. My name is Carlos de Pons. I'm the CEO of Remediate. Our mission is to clean the planet, feed the world. And it's more than just a slogan, that's what we actually do. We've developed the technology through photobioreactors to that literally take CO2 from flu stacks, and from any emitter and convert that through the power of microalgae into a valuable biomass. And that biomass can be used for such applications as animal feed, fertilizer, or even extracting the very high value chemicals from that, such as the omega-3s. And these are essential amino acids which are required by mankind for health and sustainability. Our technology has been 10 to 20 years in its development. We have the smallest footprint of any comparative technology out there. And we're able to take, uh, for every tonne of biomass that we produce, the algae consumes two tonnes of CO2. So it's a rapacious eater of CO2. The technology that we put out there at our sites is profitable. We profitably handle CO2, unlike the other technologies, which are just simply storage and are viewed as a cost. We actually turn a profit on the CO2. We view CO2 as a valuable resource and the industry and the emitters should think of CO2 as a resource in their own right. I'm happy to talk more about this at a later stage. Back to you, Jagadish. Thank you very much, Carlos. That's a brilliant introduction. One more set of valuable capabilities out there. Uh, 
renewable energy can address the challenges of the power industry and avoid the emissions uh, from fossil fuel power stations. But then there are still emissions generated from the process which are unavoidable and uh, products like yours are the ones which can uh, address problems in a major way and as I said profitably too for uh, investors and for organizations with heavy emissions. Uh, and we'll delve into that in a bit more detail. Um, over to you, Richard. You have the biggest challenge in terms of influencing the policy decisions or what we call changing the tone at the top. Uh, Thank you, Doug. Thank you, Jagadish. Yes, um, very briefly, my name is Richard Collins and I'm the founder of an organization that um, operates a global accreditation for environmental and social responsibility. Um, and in many ways, the process of accreditation is what's important. It's not the mark. So this isn't about box ticking. This is about um, backing up your claims with evidence to support that you are making an impact. And we've noticed a, a definite change in the recent uh, eight, last 18 months, especially um, as we've come out of the pandemic it, with regards to attitudes towards what the future uh, is going to look like with regards to green technology and green innovation um, and where the big problems and the barriers that we're going to come into uh, we're going to discuss a little later on come into this so for us uh, at CSRA um, the accreditation mark uh, um, is delivered through a framework of pillars the pillars are environment workplace community and philanthropy and what we try and get organizations to do is baseline what they're already doing against those pillars to then continue a sustainability journey and part of that sustainability journey is being aware of emerging technologies of opportunities um, so this is around you know how we can invest smartly uh, into in terms of green tech one of the other hats i wear is i'm a senior advisor to the uk government's all parties parliamentary group for esg so it's been interesting to look at what the ESG agenda is um, uh, uh, against what the environmental and social responsibility agenda is, where there's the overlap and where the opportunities exist in terms of um, investing in technologies. And I think a big word that hopefully we can, we can look at in a bit more detail later is transition, because for me, this is all about transition. But in order to understand what transition means, we have to communicate. And something that we're aware of um, as an organization is when we're talking to organizations who are innovating in green tech, um, the biggest problem is the communication between the innovators and the potential customers and ultimately uh, ultimate benefactors of those technologies. So it's understanding the language of sustainability um, in a world that has become increasingly complex um, around jargon and tech and acronyms and industry industry sector terminologies. So it's about creating some clarity and, and a direct link between the benefits of transition and, um, and, and innovative green technology and businesses and organizations appetite to um, deliver uh, on their sustainability commitments. Thank you very much, Richard. That's a, a brilliant introduction. I and mean, then changing the tone at the top is the first Set of things that has to be done and it's quite a complex exercise once it's better than as we call it then it becomes a kind of snowball effect that helps the organizations to run on their own and that is a brilliant segue uh, i have a few questions to Irwin, but before i do that perhaps i'll also introduce myself a bit uh, hi everyone, I am Jagadish, the CEO of Innovo Profitable Net Zero for India. Uh, what we do is work with extremely unique organizations such as the ones that you see on this panel, uh, bringing in uh, the technology providers in front of customers like Irvin or Ashok when he joins and see how we can resolve the emissions challenges or the waste and circularity challenges these organizations are facing today and that's what Innovo is all about we have access to hundreds of profitable clean climate and waste technologies and we help organizations achieve their climate action net zero and circularity goals and with that uh, i'll then uh, ask Irvin a few questions uh, you know, you, uh, Dalmia Bharat was one of the many organizations uh, that constituted 
CSR committee right at the board level uh, a few couple of decades ago if not more what made dalmia bharat to go for it was a very small organization at that time very pioneering in its thinking and not only that established a ESG committee as well underneath it as part of the overall CSR committee and the second part of what i learned is you have also managed to have a lot of your business units embrace climate actions it's, it is not fully a top down for you your business units also seem to do it bottom up and the third thing is you seem to have turned things on its head which is people say that uh, anything which is green and environmental friendly is expensive on the other hand you have reversed it and said no our green products are cost competitive you are green cement or building materials so can it so throw a bit of light on that uh, and what initiated the key ones uh, that you have implemented what guides your organizations what motivates the people in the organization to aim for more and more so thank you jagdish uh, uh, it's a simple question but uh, answer to that is not that simple you know it's very complicated uh, you know driving uh, agenda like esg sustainability health and safety which actually doesn't add to bottom line initiative uh, uh, you know it's very difficult to bring that agenda on the uh, priority list uh and it doesn't come without the leadership commitment you know so it's all up starts with our promoters and uh, we were the uh, first cement company in india we started somewhere around 87 88 years uh before even before the independence uh, you know we started and uh, since then it has been uh, uh, our promoters vision while at that point of time sustainability or climate change or esg these jargons were not there uh, but definitely he used to believe that whatever we are is because of uh, our society and because of our nature and uh, we can't do business uh, by exploiting the society or exploiting the uh, nature uh while it is essential for improving the quality of the life quality of life of the people over here but at the same time we need to equally compensate back to the society and back to the nature that was the thought process which uh, our founders had and uh, uh you know since that with that thought process it 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 trickled down to you know taking care of people taking care of stakeholders creating value for the stakeholders and now that's why because of uh, this we are here and you would see we are the pioneers for almost everything you know we were the first cement producer in india we were the first to commit for net zero uh, we were the first to respond to brsr uh, uh, you know 3 years before actually it was made mandatory a uh, uh, lot of voluntary things we have done uh, now uh, you know whether it is setting up a carbon capture plant or setting up any other this thing so we are the first movers uh, you will see we are a member of first movers coalition we will you will see we are member of the lead it uh, in g20 also at least three work streams we participated whether it is circular economy whether it is so primary driver to this is uh, our founders and our promoters now secondly uh, i i will take a little more time uh, you know uh, and you may stop me uh, at this any point of time uh, but we believe that clean and green is sustainable and profitable uh, and uh, first we have to be sustainable and then profitability will come later uh, so that was uh, our philosophy that clean and green is sustainable and profitable and uh, that's how we started working on it how to bring down uh, the co2 footprint of the cement and uh, for that reason whether to have alternate how can we get rid of fossil fuel so in a time bound manner we decided that we get rid of fossil fuel and we publicly com- uh, committed also we had uh, uh, i'm sure we will meet those timeline but uh, we are not shy of uh, committing publicly and taking a pledge publicly that to it to it even on the blended cement side uh, our uh, uh, we are almost uh, using uh, 
42% uh, west of the other industries in uh, producing our own cement and we have a uh, target uh, to bring it down to bring it to a level of 50% and we'll only have 50% of the clinker uh, which is the uh, CO2 emitting uh, uh, substance of the cement and 50% we use recycled material or waste uh, so this is what uh, more kept us motivating you know and whenever something comes up uh, we know it may not add to our bottom line immediately but going forward at least it will prepare us uh, we have one object we have one uh, objective in front of us we have an aim in front of us and that keeps us motivating to do newer and newer things and exploring newer and newer things uh, you know to produce a sustainable product and taking care of our society Brilliant. Thank you for that. Uh, and I think uh, one of the things that you said is renewable energy uh, and you have gone up uh, or nearly reached 100% in renewable energy usage. Uh, no, 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 not, not 100%. It's 21%. But by 2030, we have a target to reach uh, 100%. And uh, there are some policy asks uh, which, uh, uh, if, we, if these are those are supported, you know, we'll be quickly reaching to those 100%. Oh, right, brilliant. Yeah. Uh, so, oh, okay. So you are likely to reach EV hundred much faster because that's, that's a smaller component. We have very few uh, vehicles uh, inbound uh, uh, logistics, so that's uh, there. So we have RE hundred, we have EV hundred, and we have EP hundred, which is yeah. which is energy productivity. So we will double our energy productivity in twenty five years of time. So we'll produce. Uh, same amount of material at half of the energy with half of the energy consumption oh, brilliant i think uh, that's a natural segue to i guess julius first before i go to curtis i think so uh, julius one of the challenges that i have uh, as Ovi uh, highlighted in her introduction about me i come from the it digital industry and one of the first thing that we do because we are all data analytics oriented is look at the data <laughs> and analyze pretty fast. Uh, heavy emissions industries, uh, and such as cement, steel, uh, or mining and metal industries, uh, uh, and others, all have very high scope one and scope two emissions. And one is from the process, the other one is in the source of power. Um, renewable energy is a great thing, but uh, implementing it at a faster pace seems to have been a challenge. Uh, one is the cost and the returns as well. So there you are as a pioneer and uh, you have been growing pretty fast. Uh, how are you able to address your customer requirements to manage their renewable energy needs? And what do you think uh, is required as part of a legislative impetus to enable this change? Yeah, thanks, Yagadish. Yeah, so in general, we all know that renewables are expanding very fast, but still that that pace is, is, is too slow, uh, I would say. Uh, it's of course, uh, th there are challenges in, in, in our industry, let's say, but it's now already clear that uh, solar and, and, and wind uh, energy is, is the cheapest option in most places of, of, of the world to, to generate the electricity. Of course, it will take time uh, to, to, to transit, uh, but it's good to see that uh, such companies as Arvins, they are just uh, making uh, the priority uh, to, to switch to renewable uh, energy faster and faster. Most of, let's say, big companies, uh, if, we, if we take their plans five years before, they were planning to, to become uh, neutral or, or switch to renewables let's say only in 2030 years now everybody is talking about 2030 which is really coming uh, quite fast so the pace is getting uh, faster and faster but of course uh, there is a big challenge uh, of, of dependency on, 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 on let's say material wise because uh, if we take the pv pv sector uh, solar solar energy uh, we are very much dependent uh, on resources from, from China, let's say, because for some of the 
core materials at PV silicon. More than 90% uh, production is, is concentrated in, in China. And, and, and this is a big challenge uh, for the whole world uh, because uh, we, we have a lot of price fluctuations, uh, the, the supply is not stable, uh, and it becomes then uh, very difficult for, let's say, large uh, projects, developers to, to plan well and then and, and, and mitigate all those risks which, which are coming alongside with, with these risks of, uh, of supply. Uh, but in general, the situation changed, changed a lot. Uh, I just read today uh, an interesting article how it was in solar 10 years before and how it changed now in 10 years. So if we just take uh, this relatively short period, 10, 10 years, so uh, situation changed dramatically. If, if 10 years before everybody was talking how solar is expensive and then it cannot uh, pay back and so on. So nowadays uh, the market is totally different. And then uh, our target uh, as a company, we are of course relatively small producer compared to, to the whole world. Mm, but our target is to push the message to, 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 to the market that uh, we need to change our mindset as well. We don't need to calculate now the payback uh, term of the investment example for PV power plant uh, which is now two three years only but we need to calculate the leverage cost of electricity how, how much it will cost you for through all the life cycle of, of power plant. and by adding uh, long-term batteries which we are developing together with nanotech uh, it could uh, change the whole picture dramatically and, and, and uh, and this is the real, let's say, uh, effort should be done into such investments which bring long-term value for everybody, for society, for the investors and for, for the producers. So this is our, our position so far. Julius, thanks a lot. I think uh, two things that you brought out was uh, the pace of change is uh, accelerating, so demand is there. So supply chain is a challenge for you. And the interesting part of how you are also addressing the supply chain is making your products recyclable and last longer so that you're not creating a problem in the future as well. So that's a brilliant thought. So uh, before I move on to Curtis, so you know, out of the 56 billion tons of emissions that are generated per year, 8 billion tons is from the energy fossil fuel uh, power generation industry and that 8 billion tons is a massive volume in itself can the world with all the will in the world and assuming supply chain problems are overcome can we eliminate this 8 billion tons of emissions by 2040 I don't know, you know, you, you need to be ambitious, otherwise you will not achieve. <laughs> so we need to set the, those targets and, and try our best, uh, I would say. Of course, uh, maybe to, to make it zero, it will be <laughs> very difficult, but to make it as less as possible, this is this should be all of our target. You see what's happening with all the fires, floods uh, uh, in, in, in the world. So we need to wake up and then really push this hard, not only in the conferences, but in day-to-day -day operations. Yeah, real action. Thanks for that, Julius. Uh, that's a brilliant uh, thing to say. Uh, and I think, uh, Curtis, over to you. There are two things that you connected. One is the energy sector itself, and you also uh, alluded to the built environment and how graphene integrated concrete or materials can uh, reduce emissions. The third thing that you also brought up was in the transportation sector. So you you are in the middle of a lot of things. Um, and uh, I mean, Irvin is up for I mean, the kind of targets he has set for himself within this organization is amazing, inspirational, and quite a few organizations are doing it. Uh, I and mean, Sebi could have talked about their investment, but let's talk about this. Thing. You're at the middle of the transportation, built environment and energy sector emissions 
uh, reduction potential. So what motivates nanotech energy to come out with this super material concept and how far ahead are we in this journey with graphene and how would graphene influence the net zero goals achievements? Yeah, thanks. So um, a lot of a lot of different questions there. So right. <laughs> just to take the last one first. So graphene has been claimed by a lot of people that they can be it can be manufactured. They actually have it. It can deliver crazy, ridiculous benefits. Um, and through my time at, at DuPont and Sabic, I've evaluated. 30 to 40 different people's graphene. When we when we evaluated nanotex graphene, the first time I saw it, um, scientists did a double take and said, hey, this, this is this is real. This is the first one we found that actually is single layer, it actually works, it actually delivers in the applications what we expect it to deliver. So where we're focusing is taking materials to the next level. Right, so the graphene is a, our graphene is a true game changer. We can make ton quantities of it. Uh, we have a repeatable process that's entirely scalable. That has been vetted by some of the largest companies in the world. Our graphene has been um, validated as a true single layer graphene by three external organizations. And what we use this graphene for is making materials lighter, stronger, more electrically conductive. Um, so it, it it will help reduce your um, electronic sizes, right? You can put it in you can put it into an electronic, uh, reduce into electronics, and you reduce your coat weight from several microns down to less than one micron, which means you can have smaller electronics in general. Um, it gets used as the base layer before you would print down the. Um, the gold or the higher value materials, and it just makes those more effective so we can use less. And in composites, you can add a very tiny fraction, less than less than a tenth of a percent of our graphene, and you can get an improvement in strength of 10 to 15. Uh, I mean, in some cases, we've seen two to three X even improvements in strength. When you put it into an adhesive, you're now able to use a whole lot less of that adhesive to get your conductivity or your strength improvement and what that gives you is ability to engineer new adhesives that have better bonding, um, higher tensile strength, better flexibility, because you don't need as much filler in, in that material. So you get to maintain the properties of the binder, keep it nice and strong. So really graphene is just, we're just at the tip of the iceberg of implementing these new technologies. And we we're working with some of the biggest names in the world to do that. Um, people are really resonating with what, what our message is and what we have. Now, taking out a step further into the batteries, one of the problems that the world sees with batteries today and inhibits some adoption of batteries in various markets, such as home energy storage or storage in places where we need it most, inner cities, where we have very high peak energy costs. Um, our battery, we, we have a battery that is inherently safe. You can, we have demonstrated in videos you can find on the internet of the battery being shot by a bullet, no fire, no flame, it still works. Where if you Google battery safety in New York City, what you'll find is posts from all the different firemen telling people to use your batteries properly because there's been over 25 deaths in the last two years attributed to lithium ion battery fires in New York City. And if it happens in New York City, it's happening everywhere. Uh, so that's another revolution we're trying to work with Solotech and bring that to houses and make just safer implementation of battery across the planet. And I think that needs to resonate more with government entities and entities in the mobility space, because when a car, when an electric car catches on fire, it burns for eight days. I mean, <laughs> or eight hours, but it can burn forever. Um, you have boats in the ocean that can catch on fire because of electrical, because the electric, uh, the electric batteries are not properly insulated or, or right for the environment. Now, that being said, those cases are one in a million, right? We, we don't have that many battery fires, but when we do have one, it's significant. And as these cars get older and they age, we're going to we're going to have more. It's just inevitable. 
Um, so focusing on what technologies we can do, we can use to protect people when they're in the in the in the vehicle. Make sure these vehicles are as safe as they can be. Uh, that's also something we're we're looking to help with. Now that that is a future roadmap for us. It's not something that we're actively engaged in as a, a young company. We're still very much focused on the shorter term, uh, more immediate returns to build the business before we can even think about supporting an automotive customer. Um, but the legislation and the government also needs to be maintained and, and catch up, right? One thing we're seeing from the United States government is this great IRA. However, the way they're deploying the IRA is to allow foreign companies to come into the States and claim the IRA benefits and take all that great benefit and money and all that great technology and further the, the initiatives of other, other regions. And it is a capitalist environment in the United States. So we are going to choose the lowest cost option, the lowest risk option. So it's, it's understood how organizations are encouraged to partner with uh, foreign entities that have more experience. However, um, I think globally, we all understand that each country, if, if we want energy independence and we want this revolution of green energy and sustainable energy, we all need our own source of ways to ways to store the energy you have to have batteries right now that is the best option whether it's uh lfp energy storage uh flow battery those are really the only options that are viable right now as far as energy storage go so it, we have to we have to as each um company and as each <clears throat> company has a piece and a push to say hey we want to be part of this change we want to have uh, sustainable future for our countries. We need our governments to be there with us saying, yeah, we're going to support you. We're going to make sure that we, that companies that are, that are developing it, um, within those countries and for those countries are supported and they're not going to get undercut. They're not going to fall, um, victim to, um, um, dumping of, of overcapacity from other, from other regions which is one of the region reasons why we're so slow in solar right now is because in 2009 uh, we had a you know the, the world suffered uh, pretty much every solar company outside of uh, asia going out of business because there was a, just a competitive a competitive edge that no one else could compete with when some regions were willing to sell sell their product at a loss so I think that that's my message is, is we we can do all the great things, but if we don't have full alignment through um, industry and through legislature, it's it's going to be an uphill battle. Thank you, Curtis. Uh, very insightful uh, comments that you made about uh, the legislative changes that are required as well as the competitive issues that comes from cross-border uh, aspects of uh, especially globalization. Um, my, what you brought out there uh, segues nicely uh, with Carlos and I hear Ashok has been uh, able to join but I, Ashok if you are alright I will come to you uh, after I have this discussion with Carlos and Richard. So Carlos uh, in terms of uh, you know, the emissions, I talked about the 56 billion tons of emissions, 8 billion tons from fossil fuel energy sources. Let's say the transportation sector can be addressed by the hybrid energy transition to hydrogen, electric vehicles and all of that. But there is still 12 billion tons of emissions from industrial processes that the world is not going to get rid of that easily. Uh, I think you pointed out early on carbon capture and Irvin has mentioned this publicly as well. Carbon capture is expensive. Uh, it comes as a cost and more as a need to maintain compliance. Uh, however, on the other hand, when carbon is utilized profitably and you can not only clean the planet as you say, but also feed the world, can you throw some color on it as to how it can be done and what is the time frame within which this can be achieved and what are affecting you in your case uh, or investments the most biggest issue as opposed to 
having customer it seems that uh, there is a huge pipeline of heavy heavy emission co- companies willing to give you emissions free of cost if you will they're also willing to give you the land electricity and water and you have the off take commitments yeah so, over to you please yeah, and it's all the debate so some of the challenges that we face because we're under, under the blanket word of ccus carbon capture utilization storage we're a utilization company so we actually take the carbon that appears in emissions and we convert it it means that some dark time down the line it gets re-emitted but these are in what you call your scope 1 scope 2 and scope 3 uh, emissions and i know richard uh, is going to be very familiar with this but our story is that the products that we produce displaces much higher carbon intensive crops and we always give the example out of corn and soybean being produced um in brazil where you have a change of use and therefore when you have all these um, elements we are four times cheaper in the co2 budget than uh, the equivalent soy that comes from those particular regions of the world so it it is getting that story out because we have to then show how we can audit that and and then spread it across and get that agreed amongst the governments who are actually putting those regulations in place to say this is what we're doing and this is why we're doing it so that's the first part so it's it is a program that we um have to get involved in quite a bit the other aspect of the challenges that we face down here you mentioned um investment but it's actually more than that it's actually getting the end to end supply chain in place because before you can put one of our installations at a an emitter we have to have pre-sold all of the output the and to give you an idea of that it means that an installation that can take a million tons of co2 out of uh, from an emitter is in the order of 100,000 to 250,000 um million it's it's well 250 million i mean it's it's a large amount of money so you're never going to put one of these installations in place unless you've got the end to end business plan and show that you can do this profitably because the people putting the money in still want to make a profit at the end of the day you know it's, I I think I've been mentioned sustainability first profitability later you know most of the venture capitalists uh the putting the money in say no nope, I want profitability now <laughs> you know <laughs> sustainability is for the other people I want uh, profitability now I've got to show that particular um route forward now that way that then ties into the whole economics of a plant and the regions around the world because the economics of putting in a plant here in Europe are very different to the economics in putting it into such as places in India or in other well, I'm going to call lower lower cost economies because whilst the cost of putting in an installation in um let's say in the UK for an argument sake is 100 million the revenue that we generate because of the local market is comparable but when we go to other environments the revenue that we generate because we want to sell the product locally is also much lower which means that the number one element of our system is the capex that we have to dramatically reduce which means that we have to manufacture locally we have to find really great business partners locally um and whilst producing algae is relatively a simple thing if anybody's got a pond at their home they know algae grows like mad and growing algae in small scale is simple growing algae at large scale is complex it's a big chemical installation and therefore we have to find local business partners that come up to the standards that we demand for them to then deploy the system at the cost that we need and finding that on a country by country basis is challenging because 
um, that there's a lot of activity that's needed in that particular element. That's a short answer. <laughs> Thank you for that, Carlos. And one other thing that you mentioned there was uh, cultivating algae at scale. And you use industrial automation and artificial intelligence for a more purposeful, uh, I think, production of products. Indeed so. So our, our core skill is the fact that there are over 100,000 different species of microalgae, each one producing different types of chemicals and have different applications. And the way that you grow them and cultivate them is all to do with the growth protocol, how much light you give it, how much nutrients you give it, when you harvest it, to actually make sure that the harvest rate is at its optimum. And of course, you have to find the local species in each country because you cannot transfer these species across. So we have microalgae that is really good for jet fuels and so. We have microalgae which is really useful uh, for the omega-3s and different types of uh, applications. There's even a microalgae that we can grow, that we can then deploy for fertilizers and even eating plastics and, and, and the type. So that's where our skill comes in, but the skill of actually putting the system together has to be a local one. Thank you very much, Carlos. I think uh, that's very useful in there. One of the things that you mentioned was scope three emissions, scope one and scope yeah. two. You no, know, here's the irony is that the people that really pay for the system, such as the emitters or the entity, aren't the people that ultimately benefit because the products then move on down the line. And it's how we actually create a system of transfer transference of that type of value. Now, um, Microsoft and the like and Google have created something called the carbon coin or being able to pay for a ton of carbon sequestered but they're in their infancy at the moment. Um, and there are a number of entities looking to see how they can actually bridge that gap. Thanks, Carlos. Richard, who are to you? You know, you have listened to the corporate customer, leader in the uh, industry, and you have listened to all these great technology providers. And there you are working with governments, uh, and advising them on CSR and ESG. How do you see this all coming together and what is to be done? Uh, especially, you know, the large corporates may somehow find the funds, but in every economy, uh, when we talk about scope 3 emissions particularly, in each and every country, even in the UK, for example, greater than 96% of UK's economy as well is SMBs, SMEs, and MSMEs. How do we take this to the masses, so to say? Um, well, I, I think we are reaching a tipping point. So, you know, one of the uh, ideas around, you know, what the incentives and motivus, mo motivations that are driving people towards more sustainability. And I think we talked to Carlos mentioned it a little bit earlier and, and others in terms of, you know, is sustainability profitable? Does it make money? Is it commercially viable? And I would argue that we're moving into an area uh, where, where this is absolutely the case. And we were very clear that um, the future shape for business will be measured in sustainable value as much as it would be in financial value. And when we talk about the drivers, we're starting to see, you know, the introduction of mandatory regulatory um, drivers um, that are coming into play. And certainly when you look at supply chain and procurement uh, requirements, um, these are pressures that are being put onto businesses to have a think about you know, their, their carbon footprint, um, the sustainability of their business and, and the transitions that they're going to have to make in the future in order to, to commit to net zero, for example. Um, and we have obviously in the background things like the TCFD and next year we've got the um, Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive coming in. Now that um, is getting to smaller businesses, so we're starting to see a trickle down um, that will come from the bigger corporates down to the smaller businesses. And in terms of the, the um, decarbonisation scopes one, two and three, um, as you well know, Jagadish, I mean, scope three is you know, up to 87, 88, 89 percent of, of your carbon footprint. And, and smaller businesses, um, engineering firms, manufacturing firms, business service providers are going to have to start to report 
um, on behalf of um, the other organizations within their own supply chains. So there are going to become more and more pressures on people to look at this. And, the, and a good example is in the UK, we have the NHS and the NHS have um, the, the carbon reduction plan, which is a, a mandatory requirement for businesses to be on the procurement roster for the NHS to then fulfill or, or, or put together their carbon reduction plan in order to have the business. And, uh, and, and to sort of te illustrate that even further, we, we are currently working with a, a Japanese based um, tech company that are developing high definition monitors um, and they are importing them into the UK and then going through a, a procurement process to the NHS. Now, this company have signed up to the TCFD, they've done everything to show the life cycle analysis of their product, um, from components to reuse to, to um, um, guarantees and all those kind of assurances around that product. Um, because the NHS in this case are going to demand that these questions are asked. Now that hasn't been the case in the past. It's been a question of stack them high, sell them cheap. So I think what we're seeing is a, is a shift towards businesses recognizing and organizations recognizing that perhaps we do need to spend a little bit more now in terms of you know the financial side of things, but the, uh, the long-term sustainability side of things, that's where the true value will be. So this is about you know how businesses transition and how organizations like the, the amazing things I'm listening to today on the panel from the guests, the great innovations around algae technology and nanotechnology. You know, I, I was speaking at a, a, a green, uh, innovation conference at Microsoft's head offices in, in Reading a few months ago and listening to stuff around agriculture and um, you know uh, hydrogen engines for aircraft and all of this sort of stuff and, and getting very excited about the fact that this is a really I mean you know when we sort of we talk about climate change and we talk about climate disaster and we, and, and we hear all the negative story what we don't hear is all the positive narrative all the amazing things that are going on and the fact that there are you know this is a you know a great opportunity you know, for the human race to really step up and innovate in a way um, that we've never done before. And I think this creates, you know, this is, this is, you know, a golden opportunity. So I think, yes, we're on that sustainability journey and it takes time. Um, but in terms of, you know, the ESG agenda, um, which is obviously very much guiding um, investment markets to be looking at the sustainability of the organizations they're investing in, but also, you know, on a granular basis, just on a human basis, just us as human beings, we want to do something. And, and this is also mirrored by the attitudes of another generation, the next generation coming into the workplace who are scrutinizing the businesses that they want to work for based on their environmental and social responsibilities. So I think the thing is we're seeing a lot more pressure and a lot more drive towards adapting to um, you know, innovative green technologies um, to ensure that we have a legacy as a human race um, for, a next, for the next generation as much as anything. But also understanding that, that you know, that we have to measure value in other ways than financial. We have to look at, you know, human capital. We have to look at sustainability capital, or environmental capital as well. So, uh, so I, I, I am seeing that, and we see this. You know, when I sit up at uh, the APPG, we sit with the big corporates, the KMPGs, and the Tartars of the world, and we talk and we see how they talk about regulatory frameworks and ratings and all this sort of stuff. But we are aware that that is now trickling down, and actually, our audience predominantly is the SME audience. As I think you've said, something like 90% or 90 plus percent of the UK businesses are SMEs. So they make up the majority of the workforce. And if we're going to change the world for the better, we've got to, you know, involve people in the process. Uh, and that means us. So we have to bring those people on the journey and encourage them to look at um, how we can achieve a sustainable future by, by engaging with the organisations that are here today to ensure that that happens. Thanks a lot, Richard. I mean, uh, interesting, uh, or rather, very great message that you said is how do we uh, get motivated by all the positive things that I heard that we have heard so far, and how do we get to the next stage using this as a tipping point to create that virtuous cycle, isn't it? Yes, I mean, I think I think I think part of the problem is communication and language. That we, you know, no one really knows what language to use. So everyone talks from a different perspective. And a good analogy again is with air source, air source heat pumps, for example. We have an industry, we have a, 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 a requirement for that all houses in the UK built now will have to have air source heat pumps as part of their, you know, to replace you know gas boilers and so on and so forth. Uh, but we don't have anyone to install them, and the language between the manufacturers and, and the and the contractors 
uh, they're not using the right language when engaging a younger generation of apprentices who want to change the world. These, this is a generation that want to make an impact. And I think part of the problem is, is joining the dots between, between you know, the language that we're using to encourage a generation to kind of get engaged um, with these technologies. And I think if we can, you know, look at how we tell those stories, which is really what it comes down to, and how we can support that with the impact that these are, that, that, that this is going to have, then I think we can bring a generation into the conversation. And that that's really where the future lies and, in, 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 you know, where the where this next generation of engineers and innovators are going to be uh, looking at, in terms of uh, what they want to do. And, and, and that really is around how they can be part of a solution in making a positive impact um, with regards um, to long-term environmental conditions. So there's a question. I don't know if, if everyone uh, on the panel is able to see this. Let me read it out. Climate crisis is a challenge and challenge is a good opportunity. Which solutions and action approach should we embrace to generate green jobs? So oh, that's an amazing question. So uh, I think I heard this from Arvind as well previously about uh, jobs and not enough skilled people available. And then opportunities among local community, uh, youth, women and indigenous people since conservation amounts to sustainability, looking at the many goals, the MDGs and SDGs. I had introduced you on your behalf, but one of the things coming very close uh, to the conversation is petrochemical industries have the greatest challenge. And yet there you are as the first organization which shipped blue ammonia. And uh, uh, of course, you uh, heard Julius yesterday as well as what Curtis and others are doing. You are on your own renewable energy as well as uh, the biomethane and stuff. Can you throw some light on what motivates SEBEC being in the petrochemical industry and bringing on change of this kind, especially with the scale of investments you have planned? Sure. Um, thanks. Thanks a lot for this uh, wonderful questions. Uh, very good morning, good afternoon, good evening to the entire uh, fellow panelists and the audience. Uh, apologize for the technical uh, glitch. Uh, so, Sabik is a petrochemical company based out of Saudi Arabia, having global footprint. Uh, uh, we make polymers, we make chemicals, we make agri-nutrients and we make uh, metals. Um, one of the important attributes in our entire journey, if you look at polymers, if you look at chemicals, we are serving the mankind uh, uh, by providing materials which are essential. Um, at the same time, we understand that our planet is facing the challenge of climate change. And, and this is something which, uh, as we continue to serve the mankind, uh, we would also like to address and play a critical role of here make our contributions. And, and for this, uh, chemical industry is one of the few industries which can not just abate our own carbon dioxide emissions, but also have the ability to abate other um, industries also uh, by providing uh, materials uh, which may have lower carbon footprint and more efficiency. So in our case, for example, uh, we have onboarded a journey of uh, becoming carbon neutral by 2050, uh, climate neutral by 2050. We are trying to uh, build the achieving our interim target of uh, 2030 uh, to reduce our emissions by 20%. Now, in doing all this, as you correctly pointed out, uh, um, uh, for organizations like us, we need to strategize ourselves and position ourselves in a very efficient and effective manner. And for this, we have uh, put a carbon neutrality roadmap, which spans into short, medium and long term. And it's founded on five pillars. The first pillar, uh, what we look at is to uh, look at energy efficiency and onboarding uh, renewable energy. But these are some things the technologies are far more mature um, and, and we are able to start working on them immediately and that will form a big chunk of our efforts to uh, achieve our interim targets of becoming um, reducing 20% of our emissions by 2030. We have also onboarded the journey of uh, our 
uh, heart of our emissions comes from our crackers uh, and and uh, we have onboarded a journey of electrifying our crackers and so that once we drive it with renewable energy we can reduce the emissions to more than 80% within the cracker this is a challenge first of its kind and we also understand we cannot do it alone so we have partnered with ESF and Linde to drive this as a model um and then we have also looked at that which are carlos and which are also touched upon uh we see on uh, a pillar of ccu and ccs um carbon capture storage and capture car, uh, carbon capture utilization and one of the largest plants uh, wherein we purify carbon dioxide convert that into urea and uh, methanol uh, and and we are also on boarding the hydrogen economy to use hydrogen as an energy now if you look at um, uh, the electrification of crackers if you look at the pillar related to ccs and uh, hydrogen the technology are relatively in the phases of maturing unlike resource efficiency and uh, on boarding um, renewable energy and and these challenges if you see of coming out with new technology coming out with your ways of addressing the problems working along with the value chain partners to bring in solutions to help meet the climate is something which is extremely challenging and and uh, sabik as an organization is committed uh, to driving uh, uh, such an agenda to kind of Uh, get to a uh, climate neutral solutions thank, thank you thank you so, so, so. very passionate uh that's helpful and in fact uh, se- uh, i mean segue is beautifully into this question uh the the first question is jobs uh and opportunities for local communities can i request each of the panelists with a one sentence answer or can i challenge you with a one sentence answer please uh, yeah. let's start with yeah go on Arvind. so bob what hillary has asked is uh, you know in a common term we, we call it as a just transition and uh, uh, there used to be a definition by ilo in 2030 uh, but of course uh, today the whole context has changed uh, that definition was there for uh, uh you know development but this is something uh with the climate change and uh to answer specific uh let's take for example uh if we want to decarbonize our operation one of the viewer wants to uh use the uh, uh renewable energy and uh, earlier we used to uh, have skill like electrician but today we are having a skill of solar technician you know th- these are the people who who installed uh, solar panels and do the maintenance of this solar panel uh, so definitely initially you will see that with the advance of technologies uh, uh, the jobs may get reduced uh, but uh, we have to keep upgrading uh, the skill sets so that eventually the uh, jobs will be available and there will be a just transition thank you and that's a great insight uh Carlos your perspective on jobs opportunities and community first time ever I got caught out by that one <laughs> our entire focus is on uh, local deployment local employment um and uh, skills transfer you know we need high skilled people in the biology and the technology to help us drive our system forward um and let me tell you the best biologists are people with passion um and i got to say it's, it's nearly all of my um female members of groups there they are absolutely the best biologists they that they uh, and we, we we promote them and we sh- cherish them so we need um lots of local people um and local skills transfer that's it thank you for that carlos and your perspective richard jobs opportunities and community yeah well i, I think that this this is um, as hillary mentioned um you know with climate challenge there is climate opportunity and the opportunity is with the jobs market and you know in other words i think 
this, this has the ability to be a win-win solution because it, it creates um, long-term jobs. Um, and when you think about um, the solar industry, the tidal industry, the renewable industries, um, the, the green innovation and tech industries, um, in terms of the STEM subjects and so on and so forth, I mean, there's a huge opportunity for a new generation to go into, which will guarantee long-term generations of work. Um, and then the impact that can have in supporting the local communities as well. So, you know, once this, you know, we're on it, this is a state of play, isn't it? This is where we're at the moment. We're on a journey, nothing stays the same. And I think we're starting to see a rapid increase in appetite and awareness you know uh, again from from a citizen level to a corporate level uh, around you know the benefit of sustainability and sustainability innovation and, 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 and green technologies so I, I think this is a wonderful opportunity especially for apprenticeships um, for people to go into an industry that is going to have a positive impact on the future for the planet and also um, guarantee a sustainable quality of life for themselves as well Thanks, Richard. I don't know if Ashok is still on the call. If not, uh, I think uh, thanks a lot to all the panelists. We are right at the end of time, uh, or rather, just overran a bit as well by 10 minutes. Uh, thank well, you to Chain Maker. Oh, sorry, Ashok, yes. One of the areas that some people are looking at is um, preventing polymers or plastics from leaking into the environment and the ones that are already leaked into the environment, how do we bring, bring them back into the value chain? So no longer you are looking at a model where you are preparing resins and sending it, but the recycling industry is getting a big boost uh, uh, through the uh, extended producer responsibility kind of frameworks and regulations that are that are coming in. So no, so need to kind of as Arvin mentioned, you not not just need to reskill uh, yourself, but start learning, work with uh, upstream and downstream partners. And this is creating today. We all know the waste collector, the recycling industry, which is being kind of an unorganized, is becoming more and more organized. The value that is getting created out of the recycled products uh, are making a big difference to the society and as uh, mentioned the younger generations are more and more looking at that. So here is a great opportunity not just from startup but the existing uh, 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 recycling industry, a huge opportunity being created for kind of getting more jobs, innovation to come out with newer ways in which you can upscale your recycled products for value creation. These are some of the great examples where uh, opportunities are coming up and individuals who try to get into that they can actually make a big difference. Hey, thanks, Ashok. Uh, my mistake in not realizing that uh, the connectivity was still on. So I think uh, it's been uh, a great uh, conversation. I hope the audience liked it and panelists, uh, thanks for sharing your insights, especially the amazing change you're bringing in. So there is hope for the future. I think that's the, uh, if I put it in terms of a conclusion and takeaway, uh, allowing me to summarize, uh, there is hope for the future. There are technologies available which can bring in change, uh, which can reduce emissions, avoid emissions, and repurpose emissions. Uh, that's what I heard. Uh, and uh, corporations and very large ones or even medium enterprises uh, are all keen to make that change. They just need to know how it can be done and with the right legislative support. I, I know there is legislative support, but with more in place and more importantly, investments coming in, it will help accelerate the pace of change with profitable returns to the investors. So uh, with that, uh, I say thanks to Changemaker 20, Amit, Urvi, uh, Suhail, Pragya and everyone. It's been a great discussion. See you all again. Have a great evening, morning or afternoon or day. Speak to you all. Thank you very much. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.